Can we uh, make a start? Hello everyone. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed your, uh, your morning tea. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, thank you for joining us for the first after, lunch uh, after morning tea talk. The first talk after morning tea at Linux Conf AU 2018 on the, on the Friday. Um, our first presenter is a, a fellow Tasmanian and a trained potato scientist who has recently moved into tech. Uh, today she'll be presenting the rom-com, the app and the wardrobe. Please make welcome Hannah Thompson. Hi, can you hear me? Yay! Uh, so, as Chris said, I'm going to be talking about a rom-com, an app and a wardrobe. So um, I work at Centre Group, which is a fancy way of saying Westfield, but I don't think they endorse this, concept, this content necessarily. Um, so hands up in the audience, who's used JavaScript? Cool, most people. Um, who's used React? Okay, a few less. Who wears clothes? Yay, so there's pretty much something in the presentation for at least everyone. Um, so this is a talk about React Native in a way. And I hope you take away some further understanding of React and React Native, at least enough to dive into the docs yourself and give it a go. But it's also a talk about history. I'm not a historian. Um, and fashion. I mean, I wear clothes. Um, so as an aside, Curls MT does not get pre-installed on Macs these days. And you actually have to pay money to download it. Um, this font is called Princess Sophia, if you ever need some Curls MT feels in your presentation. Um, <laughs> so, uh, ladies and blokes and non-binary folks, I stole that from the internet, um, hold on to your seats. In the spirit of this year's conference theme, I want to take you back in time uh, to 203-ish years ago, to 1815, a time of bonnets and marrying for financial stability and dying in childbirth. That's not funny. <laughs> to a time of Jane Austen. This is Jane Austen. She was born in 1775 and she died in 1817 at the age of 41. She wrote seven amazing novels and a bunch of other stuff um, in her short life and gave us a humorous snapshot of the time she lived and a smart commentary on relationships and what women had to put up with to succeed. Now, I bet you're wondering what Jane Austen has to do with a talk about computers. Yeah, what's a computer? <laughs> That's a really good point, Jane, and it's fair enough for her to ask. Around the same time lived this guy. This is Charles Babbage. He was a bit younger than Jane Austen. He was born in 1791 and he died in 1871. So he lived a lot longer as well. He's widely considered to be the father of the modern computer. Well, That's a really good point, young Charles Babbage. Um, you know, young, uh, young Babbage here might have had some emerging thoughts of what an analytical engine was back when he was this baby-faced. But when Jane Austen died in 1817, Babbage was still struggling to get a professor position. Actually, in 1817, Charles Babbage applied to be a professor at the University of Edinburgh and was rejected in favour of William Wallace. Sorry. Shit, no, sorry, wrong slide. Uh, William Wallace, <laughs> uh, a mathematician and a guy who does not have a lot of pictures on the internet. Really must have locked down his Facebook profile. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Ironically, as a mathematician, this is what Jane Austen would have called a computer at the time. Someone who can compute stuff in their head. Anyway, back to Jane. In 1815, Jane Austen released a novel about this lady, Emma. Emma was an independent woman, which at the time really meant she had a lot of money. So she was an independently wealthy woman. So she didn't have a lot of the cares of the women of the time, um, i.e. men were for fun, not profit. Now, this is going to be a central theme of the talk today. Emma was, most importantly, a matchmaker. 
She loved meddling in the lives of her friends, family and servants, setting them up with each other. And they mostly let her do it because she was very pretty and very rich. Emma was also a fashionista and probably had the honour of doing one of the first ever makeovers in a fictional, no <laughs> fictional work. Um, Emma the novel was about how people connected and about communication misunderstandings. A lot of communication in the book is done through letters, leaving a lot to the imagination of the characters. It reminds me of people today sending messages to each other on their phones and then guessing at the subtext of what they really meant. Another good question, and an even fairer one this time, but we'll get into phones in a minute. As an aside, Alexander Graham Bell wasn't even born when Jane Austen died in 1817. So, we've now met Jane Austen and Emma and a few other characters who will be playing a minor part in today's presentation. I want you to hold on to your seats again, because this time we're going to time travel into the future to 1995. <laughs> a year of Furbies, Tamagotchis, some Windows thing happened, Braveheart, First Lady Hillary Clinton, the release of Match.com, the website, and the Macarena. It was a big year. Also, in 1995, Cher. Cher is a modern interpretation of Emma and the main character in the movie Clueless from 1995. Again, she's an independent woman, and again, her wealth may have something to do with that. She's a matchmaker, trying to set up her friends and teachers, in part to make her life easier and more entertaining. And most importantly, she's a fashionista. Cher's life revolves around clothes, fashion, and the statement she's making with her choices. By now, you're probably wondering if you've signed up for a talk about girl stuff. You have, sorry. <laughs> but I do have a point, I promise. And as an aside, girl stuff is awesome. If you're sitting in your seat right now going, yeah, but girls like, I don't know, Justin Bieber and stuff. Did you know in Jane Austen's day, people were all like, novels are for girls. You should be reading real things like history books and newspapers. <laughs> anyway. Here, we have the reason for you all sitting in this lecture theatre today, today, listening to me talk. I'm about to play this video to demonstrate my point, uh, and not for entertainment, so I'm probably going to talk over the top of it. So, here we have Cher waking up, going to her wardrobe to pick out an outfit for the day, but wait, no, there's a computer in her wardrobe with a touch screen, which is pretty magical in 1995. She swipes through her wardrobe to pick out an outfit. There's some AI happening in the background. She gets dressed, pretty magical stuff. Perfect outfit, done. Now she can go get dressed for the day. I think this was actually a pivotal point for a lot of young women, realising the impact that they wanted technology to have on their lives. Instead of marketers and technologists telling them what they wanted, they had a writer exploring what someone like them might want. And it's actually so simple for today's technology to do something like this. In 1995, having a touch screen in your home computer would have been pretty extraordinary. Uploading a photo from a digital camera was doable, but required a lot of cabling and waiting. Um, any kind of AI telling you whether your clothes was fashionable would have been the stuff of sci-fi. But in today's technology, we all have a touch screen sitting in our pockets with a camera attached. Um, matching colours on an outfit together wouldn't be that much of a reach. Um, and with enough data, machine learning, what people thought was fashionable, probably doable. If you missed it in the video, here is the Clueless app again. There's some really interesting design choices there with the leopard skin background. But at its heart, it's really just a fruit machine for clothes. OK, one last time. I know you're all getting a bit dizzy, but we're going to zip through time once more. To 2018, to today. 
to the year of the creepy robot that Amazon wants you to put in your bedroom to watch you get dressed and then judge you on your outfit choice against some metric of style that someone else decided instead of letting you decide how your clothes fit your own style. A voice activated robot with a camera connected to the internet in your bedroom. A camera Amazon want you to use and then upload images of yourself to be judged by others and then presumably pad their database of humans wearing clothes for their machine learning algorithms. And I think the worst thing about it to me is it actually does nothing to confront the biggest problem we face today, floor drip. <laughs> but it's not all terrifying machines. Turns out the app from Clueless really touched something in the zeitgeist. If you search Clueless app on Google, you will get a bunch of results from people telling you this is the next Clueless app or how do I get the Clueless app? People really want this app. And there have been many attempts to recreate it. There are numer numerous mobile apps that let you upload your wardrobe and then try and create outfits from it. But unfortunately, they're all pretty much closed source and not free, not as in beer or as in freedom. And they kind of just don't do it quite right. Turns out a lot of women are massive nerds when it comes to clothes and they want to catalogue and optimise their wardrobes and outfits. A fairly new phenomenon is the capsule wardrobe, where people pare down their clothes and accessories to a few select pieces that can be mixed and matched with each other. When you only have 20 items of clothing, it kind of makes it much more possible to upload your entire wardrobe to an app and then you can see them whenever you want. And of course, there's the likes of Pinterest, Instagram, and the flat lay. Women are turning platforms like this into ways to catalogue and document their fashion choices in, frankly, a really nerdy way. I want to make a quick shout out to Paul Fenwick's talk at the Games Miniconf earlier this week about women getting into technology through their fandoms. I'd like to add clothes to that list. I hope Pinterest, Pinterest flat lays our gateway tech to um, image editing, building websites, putting LEDs and microcontrollers into dresses, pocket sewing boffs at, in the LCA hallway. Yeah. I don't think we should underestimate what people are trying to do with the technology that we create. So, there's a lot out there. But nothing is quite meeting the simplicity of swiping through your clothes and fruit machine style, finding a stylish outfit that you hadn't thought of before. Now, a bit of personal history. Last year was a really big year for me. I attended my first LCA in Hobart, and during that week, I actually emailed my boss and quit my job. I'd received a phone call during one of the talks, um, and I'd been offered a scholarship to take a diploma of software development. At the time, I worked in government policy. So it was a huge jump for me, but it's something I really wanted to do. I was at LCA after all. So, On finding out that I was quitting my job and taking up coding full time, the first thing one of my friends, Jules, asked me, demanded of me, was that I make the Clueless app. <laughs> she didn't care about anything else. She just wanted that app. So I did. In mobile form, because I feel like Sher would appreciate that. She was always connected. To her phone. So this is the Clueless app. It's a pretty simple app. It's really just a prototype to kind of work through ideas. But it allows you to upload images of your clothes. Um, it talks to a node API sitting elsewhere on the internet and shuffle everything to get a random combination of tops, bottoms and shoes um, and to make outfits you wouldn't have necessarily considered. And yeah. Here it is in action. You can shuffle and stop shuffling and swipe through th things to get some really, like, that's a good outfit right there. <laughs> so I made this app in React Native, which is an open source JavaScript framework for mobile development uh, by Facebook, and it's based on React. It's still, um, all the source code for this is up on GitHub. Um, it's not great, but it does the job. Um, my GitHub is Hannah Can Code if you want to have a look. So, 
I just love this image. <laughs> um, now we're going to go get into some of the actual tech. So let's have a look under the bonnet of React Native. React Native is pretty much the idea of React taken out of the browser and put in a native mobile environment. Sorry, I had to use that. React Native is much more native than most JavaScript mobile frameworks. Other frameworks like Ionic and Cordova use a native container with a web view to render JavaScript. So essentially you're just writing a web page in a browser in a native container. React Native uses JavaScript Core, which is what iOS uses to render JavaScript in your mobile browser. But JavaScript Core is also accessible outside of the browser. Um, and this is how React Native uses it. So it accesses it directly. For Android, uh, React Native compiles its own version of JavaScript Core with your app. So because we're not in the browser, React Native can access native UI components. Once again, something like Ionic uses normal HTML and CSS, but in React Native, we can actually access the native UI that is used by regular mobile apps. So, why would, excuse me, why would you want to use React Native and JavaScript to develop a mobile app? Well, you're a JavaScript developer. I'm a JavaScript developer, and I wanted to make an app quickly without having to learn Objective-C or Swift or Java. We may have gone beyond explaining things in a way Jane Austen can understand territory. So, why else? Well, you might need to build an app that runs on both Android and iOS devices and share source code between them. This really speeds up the development process because you only have to write apps once and it will compile for both devices. There are some inconsistencies that you might have to code for twice, but for the most part you get one app running on two systems. You might have an existing React app that you want to make mobile. In this case, you can essentially copy and paste a lot of your existing code and reuse it, just modifying the HTML and CS for native UI components. You might be really impatient and you want hot reloading during development. So you no longer have to wait for your code to compile each time you want to see a change. You can just save and ta-da, it automatically shows up in your simulator as the new whatever you've done. Um, point, this is Linux conference after all, we love open source. You don't think you'll be needing to sue Facebook just yet. React Native is still licensed under the BSD3 plus patents license that caused a whole stir in the middle of last year. Um, Facebook recently re-licensed their new versions of React, Jest and a few other things to M MIT and they say a re-license for React Native is in the pipeline, but fingers crossed. Okay, so now we've kind of covered the context stuff, I'm going to dive into the code um, and give you a bit of a walkthrough. So the four things I want to cover today are components, props, state, and events. These are the four things I want you to take out of this room. If you ignore the rest, that's okay. So, let's get set up. Disclaimers first. If you want to write an iOS app, you're going to need a Mac computer. That's just Apple, because you need Xcode. Um, if, you want an, if you want to write an Android app, you can use Mac, Windows, or Linux. Either way, you're going to need Node installed, and then either Xcode for iOS, or the Java Development Kit and Android Studio for Android. You can still hack on a React Native app without these, but you're not going to be able to see it in the simulator or get it onto a device. So, imagine we're in Macworld. First, we'll use Homebrew to install Node. Then we'll use Homebrew to install Watchman. Now, Watchman is a nice little thing from Facebook that basically watches your code, and whenever you uh, save it or change anything, you can put build steps in so it'll rebuild your app or do whatever you want. Um, but in the case of React Native, it rebuilds it so it shows up in the simulator straight away. Um, yeah, so this allows us to do hot reloading. 
So next, we will in, use NPM, which comes with Node, to install the React Native CLI. You can also use Yarn if that's more your flavor. I know there's a few knitters in the audience. Um, and finally, we'll use React Native to initiate our new app. Um, we go into our app, and then we use the React Native CLI to run it for iOS. There's also a run Android command, and this spins it up in the simulator, so it looks something like that. Now, if you want an easier way to check out React Native, or you're not quite ready to dive into Xcode or Android Studio, um, you can use Expo, which is an open source tool for displaying React Native apps kind of in the browser. And this, combined with another open source tool, Create React Native App, um, that runs you up a sample app that requires very little tweaking, uh, very little configuration, and runs automatically in Expo. So that's worth looking into if you just want to have a little play without diving into the whole Xcode debacle. So, if you feel familiar with Node development, you recognize package.json. If you're not, you don't need to understand that. It's just a JSON file that lists all the things NPM needs to know to download your dependencies and run your packages in your app. So, take a quick look inside, and we can see it's bringing in some React stuff, some React Native stuff, some testing stuff, some Babel stuff, so we can compile our fancy JavaScript back to vanilla JavaScript. The great thing about React Native is you have a community creating packages for native libraries, UI, logic, and if you install them with NPM or Yarn, they'll turn up here. So, if you're familiar with React or HTML, but not with React Native, this is a div tag. Probably will have seen this if you've looked at any source code on the internet. In React Native, this turns into a view tag, which is a native UI. Again, a P tag. That's kind of like a text tag. So, the first thing I want you to remember is components. Components are basically a chunk of UI. In this, we have some text components, and they're all wrapped up inside a view component. Now, I promise, I must have been channeling Jesse Frizzell last night, because you may recognize this first analogy. Yeah. Components are like Lego. <laughs> um, in React Land, everything in your UI is a component, basically. I like to think of components like Lego. So the smallest chunk of Lego you can get is a Lego block. You can use Lego blocks to make up a wall of Lego or a wall component. You might then use four wall components to start building a house, or you can reuse the wall component for a bigger wall, or you can use it for something else entirely. Amongst other things that the React Native init command that we ran earlier has created for us, there's an index.js file which is just a basic JavaScript class. Uh, so this is the entry point for our app for both iOS and Android development. Um, and if we look into this file, first we import some stuff from React. We import some stuff from React Native. You don't need to understand this, but if you do, great. Um, we set up a class, our app. We create a render method. Am I cutting out? No? And then the render method is where we put all our UI stuff. So if you're familiar with React, it's just React. So it's not really a huge learning jump. Finally, we register the entry point of our app so the React Native package knows where to dive in and build from. That's some Xcode stuff. You really don't need to know that. OK, so inside our render method, of J, um, sorry, inside our render method, we use something called JSX, which looks like this. Uh, JSX is um, kind of a markup language that allows us to use um, HTML markup within JavaScript. So here's what a view component that we saw earlier in the simulator looks like in JSX. Inside the view component, we can build in some text components, and we can use JavaScript inside our JSX 
by escaping with curly braces, something like that. So here we're um, accessing a JavaScript object called styles and then passing that back into the style parameter of the component. So we can style our components individually. And that looks something like what we saw earlier. So remember the Clueless app from earlier? The one I made, not the actual one. Um, we can break down this app into essentially just two components. We have a carousel component, which is repeated three times, and a footer component. Pretty simple. Those components might have other stuff inside them, but at the very top level, you've got two things. Um, so you can have stuff inside other components. You can make components on components on components. Um, and you can use that principle to make components out of the provided React Native UI. So at a very basic level, we can make a non-functioning footer out of two text components that's sitting next to each other. Text is a native UI component and would be similar to a div or a span in HTML. So that might look something like that. The first thing to note here is that we're creating a new class called footer and we're extending the React class component. So that basically means we can access all the stuff inside the React class component um, that they've provided for us. It has methods and stuff. Um, and then we can add our own methods and data on top of that. So the second thing to note is that footer is spelled with a capital letter. In React, all your components are going to start with a capital letter. It's just convention. Um, so we can pop our text components in there, and we've made a magic footer component that doesn't do anything. So now a note on styling. React Native Apps use Flexbox, which you might be familiar with as a CSS concept for arranging items, and they use that just to arrange items on the screen. It actually makes uh, it surprisingly easy to center things like vertically, uh, which is quite hard in CSS. Um, so here, for example, um, with a flex-enabled parent component, um, one carousel that we made previously can sit in the middle of the, its container, and then three will stretch to fill the available space. So in the front-end world, there's a lot of discussion about where styles should sit in relation to HTML and CSS, um, but in React Native, you have no choice. Uh, your style is have to sit within your JavaScript because they are JavaScript. So, they're CSS-like, but they aren't exactly the same as CSS. We use a stylesheet class to make a new stylesheet object and assign it to a constant that we can then give to our components. We add in some classes within the object, and these can be assigned to individual components wherever we want to import our stylesheet. A couple of things to note. Pretty similar to CSS, except it's in camel case. Um, and most components have a style, a style prop that you can feed down your stars to. So we've just come to our second concept to remember, props. To make our footer component more reusable than it was before, uh, we can split out a new component, say a footer button, and pass it down a string. You can name your prop whatever you want. Um, and you can pass it strings, numbers, functions, variables, whatever JavaScript stuff you want to pass it. Now we can access the prop from inside the component itself. So let's look at our shiny new footer button component. Uh, it's just a class again with a render in it. Um, so here we have something called touchable opacity, which is just a fancy name for a button. Um, that <laughs> changes opacity when you press it. Um, and we're going to put some text and an image inside it. Um, we can use this.props.type to access the type prop that we just gave this component. Um, the name of the prop matches whatever you've called it in the parent component. Note again, there's the curly braces to use to use JavaScript within our JSX. So this.props is an object and we're going to be accessing just the type part of it. Um, and now with two of these footer buttons together, it might look something like that. We have 
put it back to front, but some image and then a text. So, so far our components don't actually do anything other than display some data that we pass down to it. Um, this is called a presentational component. In this case, we don't even really need to write it as a class because we aren't going to access any of the class stuff that React gives us. So this is our footer button component rewritten as a function. The function's still called footer button with a capital letter to start the name and it takes the props object as an argument. Um, this means we can just call props because we've got it as an argument now. Props.type instead of this.props.type. Now there's a whole presentation in itself on this in JavaScript, so feel free to go off and research that in your own time and then make that presentation because I want to see it. Um, so if you haven't used JavaScript in a while, this may look a bit strange to you, but this is called a fat arrow function in ES6 um, and it has a different syntax to old functions, but it's also worth looking into. So. You can ignore all that. We've covered pro components and props. And now here's our third concept to remember, state. So maybe we'll, we want to keep track of some information that changes as our app is used. To do this, we need to go back to using a class instead of a function. To the start of our class, before the render method, we add a constructor method and pass in props. We can then add information to this dot state, which is another object. So let's add some state for is uploader active. So we can track whether our photo uploader is active or not. Uh, this dot state is local state and can only be accessed by the component that it's in, unless you pass state around through props, but that's a bit more difficult. So if you're going to be using a complex state, you probably want to look into using one of the state management packages for React, such as Redux, Flux, Morbex, there's a bunch of them, um, and they will also work in React Native. So, now that we have our isUploader active in state, we can access it via this.state.isUploader active. The logic would look something like this. Uh, if our uploader is active, return our uploader else return our carousels. This is called conditional rendering. So we've concovered components, props, and state. Finally, we've reached our fourth concept to remember, events. So back to our footer button, which currently doesn't do anything. It just displays some text and changes the opacity if you press it, which is, you know, maybe not that useful. So. What we're going to do is add an on press event so it actually does something when you press it. So here's the touchable opacity part of our footer button component. We're going to add an on press prop, so on press equals something, and then we'll add a JavaScript function to this. Uh, note again we're using the curly brackets to escape and write some JavaScript. So we're going to use React's set state method. This is provided for you. Um, some things to note about set state, because you might end up using it a lot. Uh, it's asynchronous. So when you do something, it's not going to necessarily happen straight away. Um, but basically, set state tells the component, hey, I've changed in some way. Re-render me. And so the React will go off and re-render the component, and it will show the new state. So when we press this button, it's going to call the function we've passed in, firing off set state, and it'll set is uploader active to true. Probably write this logic slightly better, but for our case it works. So here's a walkthrough of that life cycle. First we have this dot state, this dot state has is uploader active set to false. Uh, when we press our button, this dot set state is going to fire off and set is uploaded active to true. And then this dot state is going to be is uploader active is true. So that's components, state, and events, which covers most of what you're going to need to know to get into the document, documentation proper and actually start building an app for yourself. 
Um, so, so far I've only shown you pretty much JavaScript that would be usable in a browser. But we probably want to do some actual native stuff because we're using React Native. So, um, with React Native you basically have a bunch of libraries that uh, are provided for you which you can access via APIs and actually use the native stuff on your phone like the camera roll or the camera or geolocation, all that kind of stuff. The user probably has to give you permission to do that, but you can ask and then use the API. So, for example, in my app, I want to access the camera roll so people can upload images that they've taken. Um, so here I'm importing camera roll from React Native. I'm using the get photos method on camera roll. I'm giving it some parameters, like maybe how many photos I want. Um, and then it's going to give me back some data which I can do something with. Um, here we have a promise. So we have to wait for the API to give us back some stuff. And then I'm going to take that data that gives me back and do something with it. In the case of my app, probably want to have a method that displays all my photos in a nice grid so that the user can go off and choose which photos that they want to upload. Definitely the wrong movie. And can I just say, I did this before I saw Jesse's talk this morning. So, so in sync. Um, so, in summary, that's a bit of history that repeated itself across my life and led me down the path of React Native. Um, I hope you gained something from this presentation, either a bit of history or a desire to watch Clueless or read an Austen novel or actually get some more technical information about React and React Native. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. So if you have a question for Hannah, Todd here has a microphone and he is going to run it to wherever you are. So put your hands up and uh, we'll take some questions, hopefully. It's, it's on. Any questions? Uh, over there in the, uh, at the, uh, near the door. What was the most difficult thing you found when getting started with React? Um, there is a bit of a like hurdle getting it all working because you're dealing, at least me, I dealt with iOS. So I was dealing with Xcode and Xcode wants everything to be perfect before it'll even show it to you on your device. So you have to get a lot of like config set up. It's not necessarily just magic working out of the box. The simulator is much better. But yeah, my, my stumbling block personally was Xcode because I haven't used that before. Um, it's a bit finicky. Uh, anyone else? We've got one up the front here. Sorry, Todd. No, you're all right. Get Todd needs his exercise. What are your future plans for the app? You mentioned some machine learning in Chair's version. Would you, do you have some thoughts about how you might do that? Yeah, there's lots of stuff I want to do with it. Finding time is difficult, but it is open source, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm actually getting some machine learning into it. I don't know, there's Amazon provides a lot of image recognition stuff, which they harvest your data to do, but whatever. Um, yeah, I'd, I think probably looking into some of that stuff to see if I could at least match colours, maybe that might be a start. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Doesn't look like... Oh. Over here? Ah, oh, yeah, one from Tim. And I'm going to give Hannah this handheld microphone so that we don't have the static on the, uh, on the speakers. Okay. Um, so my question is, why doesn't your app have the leopard print background? <laughs> well, I actually made a considered design choice to update it for our more modern tastes and sensibilities and UX. Um, I really wanted to kind of showcase the clothes themselves and not have this really distracting leopard print background. Also, maybe Peter would have had a problem. I don't know. So, yeah, it was an actual, I documented this decision. <laughs> I'll take that back to you. Question at the back. Oh, no, we've got another question. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
can React Native do like landscape and things like that and different views? Yeah, basically um, you have access to how tall the screen is, whether it's landscape portrait. Um, so whatever UI you would like to create, it will somehow fit inside the phone. Yeah. So could you add the leopard skin background if you put on landscape? <laughs> wow, I didn't realise people wanted the leopard skin background. Maybe I'll add that as an option. <laughs> uh, we have one over here. Sorry, Todd. It's fine, mate. It's all good. I've also got a question when everyone else runs out of questions. Um, so this will work on both sort of iOS and Android. Um, the camera wall um, tool that comes up, is that going to look the same on both of them or do they look like native widgets that are sort of slightly different on different platforms? So the UI that I showed you with that grid of photos, that's uh, me imposing my UI on a bunch of data that was returned from the API. So it would currently look the same across both devices. Um, probably skin the buttons to make them look more Android-y if you wanted to, but um, that UI is nothing to do with the Photos API. That's purely how I've just displayed it. So, yeah. You can have your question, but only after you do a lap of the room. <laughs> <laughs> when would you not use React Native? Have you got any suggestions? Is there any edge cases you think it's not useful for? Um, I think it mainly depends on what tooling you're comfortable with. So if you're more comfortable with Java or Objective-C or whatever, you would probably use those instead. Again, there's some licensing issues with Facebook. So if you do have a lot of patents you want to protect, I don't know, maybe don't use it. Um, but yeah, if, it's mostly if you're a JavaScript developer and you want to get into mobile apps, it's a really easy way to do it. Um, I know Instagram are currently using React Native. Um, there's a few local Sydney apps that are currently converting bits of their website over to React Native. Um, but yeah, it's more a personal choice, I think. Um, so thank you for your talk. Uh, I can say that this room is now considerably less clueless about React, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, I have here this nondescript paper bag from the audience as a token of our appreciation. Uh, everybody, please thank Hannah for a wonderful talk.